Hello, everybody. I think folks can hear me. Can I get a thumbs up if I'm hearable? Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I am so excited about the guests that we have joining us today. I would like to present Dr. Emily Denton. Emily Denton is a senior research scientist at Google studying the societal impacts of artificial intelligence, technology, and the conditions of AI development. Prior to joining Google, Denton received their PhD in machine learning from the Courants Institute of Mathematical Sciences at NYU, focusing on unsupervised learning and generative modeling of images and video. Though trained formally as a computer scientist, Denton draws ideas and methods from multiple disciplines and is drawn towards highly interdisciplinary collaborations in order to examine AI systems from a socio-technical perspective. Their recent research centers on a critical examination of the histories of data sets and the norms, values, and work practices that structure their development and use that make up the underlying infrastructure of AI research and development. Denson is queer and non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. They are also a circus aerialist, rock climber, and cat parents of two after my own heart. Please join me in welcoming to the CITP lunch seminar lecture series, Dr. Emily Denton. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, awesome. Um, can I get a thumbs up if folks can see that? Yes, okay, awesome. Cool, so thanks again for having me. Um, this talk is basically gonna be a mashup of four uh, recent papers that I've worked on. Um, it's, it's my first time giving this particular talk. Uh, so welcome uh, any feedback afterwards and I hope we can have a generative discussion. Uh, but it's pulling on, these are, these are the kind of the four main bodies of work if anybody wants to go afterwards and kind of dig in deeper to some of the stuff that I'm talking about. Not gonna cover each one comprehensively, but this is the kind of grounding for it. So to start, um, the starting point for this talk is really just the recognition that data underlies nearly everything that is done in the field of machine learning. Um, and as such, it's a really critical site for inquiry and intervention if we're trying to understand and intervene in the harms of machine learning systems. So um, before getting into the kind of meat of this talk, I just wanna give a super quick primer on machine learning data set bias and harms. I think a lot of this is fairly, um, you know, well, well tread territory at this point, but just a really, really quick overview of some of the kinds of prevalent biases we're seeing in these machine learning data sets. So in recent years, there's been growing concern regarding the degree and manner of representation of different sociodemographic groups within prominent machine learning data sets. Facial analysis data sets, for example, have been shown to significantly underrepresent darker skinned subjects. Um, and this has direct implications for models developed from this data. Um, common object recognition data sets skew heavily towards Western images and again, um, this has direct implications for systems trained on these data sets. Um, this particular slide shows that object recognition systems have been shown to perform poorly on images depicting objects from non-Western homes. Stereotype aligned correlations have been identified in computer vision data sets and natural language processing data sets. Um, and these again have implications for models developed from these data sets. Um, multimodal data sets that contain images alongside textual descriptions um, can pose some additional concerns because there's a much less constrained um, kind of relationship between images and descriptions. Um, a recent audit of one of these data sets um, found a kind of male gaze embedded in these data sets um, where they found that words associated with evaluating physical attractiveness such as sexy, beautiful, and pretty were overrepresented in images describing women relative to men. Um, there have been a lot of really uh, inappropriate content found in these data sets, like slurs, um, stereotypical depictions of different groups, um, explicit content, and more. Um, categories that are structuring these data sets have also come under um, a lot of scrutiny. Um, there's a couple of different uh, data sets that have been found to include really toxic categories like racial slurs and derogatory phrases. Um, and text data sets, I focused a lot on images, but text data sets are not immune from these concerns. Um, a lot of these data sets pull 
from internet sources like Reddit or Twitter, um, and these sources can overrepresent certain hegemonic viewpoints um, in large part due to structural barriers that um, make these sites less welcoming for marginalized communities. Okay, so really, really, really quick summary of all sorts of things that can go wrong with the contents of machine learning data sets. Um, and this is just sort of to set the stakes a little bit um, for kind of what gets embedded in these data sets and ultimately filtered into machine learning systems. But the remainder of this talk is actually going to kind of step back and focus less on individual data sets and more on the role that data sets play in the social and scientific organization of the field of machine learning. So taking this really, really kind of broad perspective. And there's three main topics that I'm going to cover in this talk. Um, kind of competition style of research, um, something that in a recent paper we term general benchmarks, and institutional concentration um, within the field. And I'll kind of work through each of these in turn, um, but just so you know where we're going, each of these um, kind of characteristics of uh, machine learning research poses challenges both for the responsible development and deployment of AI systems, but also for the scientific validity and kind of progress of the field. Um, so before diving into those three issues, just a little bit of a background on machine learning benchmarks. So for the purposes of this talk, a task refers to the specification of a problem um, via some kind of mapping of inputs and outputs. Tasks um, for machine learning practitioners might be of interest for a variety of reasons. They might directly map onto a use case there might be some problem that somebody wants to automate, or they might illustrate some kind of cognitive capability, um, maybe a capability that humans have that we want to program into machines. And generally, um, tasks can be defined via some description, or, and this is where we're going to focus here, defined by a data set um, through input-output pairs. So just to make this super concrete, um, I might define a task of identifying each of my two cats in a set of images. Um, the input space would be images of my cat. The output space would be two different labels, birdie or toast. And a data set would provide a mapping between an image of each of my cats and the correct output label. This then gets fed to a machine learning system who then learns to automate this kind of um, prediction. So a machine learning benchmark then consists of a data set and a metric. And this metric is going to summarize a model's performance over a task or a group of tasks by counting successes or failures at the level of individual test items. So, for example, in the very simple case of my cat labeling, a success might be defined as outputting the correct cat name for a given cat photo. And a typical metric of success would be overall accuracy. How many cat photos were labeled with the correct name of the entire full set? So, the data set coupled with a metric of evaluation. That's typically what um, comprises a machine learning benchmark. So benchmarks then can be understood as measurement devices. They enable stack ranking of models or methods based on some kind of aggregate metric. So different machine learning researchers can develop their models, come together on a benchmark, and really easily compare their different methods on that particular um, task. And benchmarking right now is the dominant mode of evaluation in the field of machine learning. Um, so I'm gonna go to a very brief history of benchmarking. We have like a little bit of a deeper history in one of these papers, um, but um, just really quickly, benchmark programs were originally used to test computer functionality in the 60s and 70s, and then they were adapted um, to more of the traditional kind of AI regime in the 80s. And they were developed within this um, framework called the Common Task Framework, which was originally developed to compare computational linguistics tasks um, within speech recognition and machine translation. And the basic idea of the Common Task Framework, you'll see a clear analogy to the current benchmarking paradigm, is you have a publicly available data set, you have a bunch of people that are competing, and you have some kind of scoring referee, some way of saying how everybody's performing, on this particular data set. And this common task framework was used um, in order to really kind of, you know, advance research on a whole bunch of very specific um, uh, problem domains and tasks. And it was developed to originally to kind of shift away from theory and towards practical results. Um, 
Then in the 1990s, this was adapted to computer vision um, and was heavily used for facial recognition um, technology and kind of led to a lot of advances um, in, in that area. Okay, so um, that's the common task framework and a little bit of history of benchmarking. Now, where we are now, um, the basic paradigm of AI research kind of falls out of this benchmarking paradigm and can be understood as this very intense competition-like scenario. So researchers, they develop these benchmark data sets that define particular AI tasks, and they define the standards by which AI models are evaluated with respect to these tasks. These data sets are typically shared as open source community resources, and this means that researchers can come together around them to develop and compare their respective models' performance. And in doing so, these data sets end up playing a really pivotal role in the social organization of the field. They end up orienting the entire community's goals and values and research agendas because the folks are coming together around just a set of these massive benchmark data sets. So I'm gonna walk through an example of like what this looks like um, with a really influential benchmark data set uh, known as ImageNet. So ImageNet is a data set that consists of about 14 million images um, labeled into over 20,000 categories. And, and the categories range from fruits to household objects to specific dog breeds, all, all sorts of categories. And a subset of this data set was utilized in a yearly competition that ran from 2010 to 2017. And to enter the competition, um, competitors would develop machine learning models um, using the benchmark training data. And then they would submit their models predictions on a separate set of testing data. And the team whose model could label the objects in the images with the highest accuracy would be the winner. So um, this already gives an example of how these benchmarks are often formally established as competitions. They aren't always in this formal kind of yearly competition framework, um, but they often are. And even ones that aren't, don't have this kind of yearly marker of winners are still sort of set up in this competitive framework. And one of the key things here is that the field now tends to really valorize best performing models on data sets that have really been kind of institutionalized and recognized as go-to standards for a particular problem domain. And so ImageNet is an example of one of these data sets where achieving a certain level of performance on the data set has come to mean so much within the field, or at least it did between the years of 2010 and 2017. This is you know, still a prevalent data set, but you know, getting marginal in improvements now um, means a little bit less than it did in say 2015. So um, in 2012, um, something pretty unique happened. Um, the ImageNet challenge was won by a team from the University of Toronto. And this team entered a neural network driven machine learning model. And this model outperformed all other competitors by a previously unimaginable margin. So we see 2011 to 2012, um, this is the error rate. We see it drops down pretty significantly. Um, and I bring up this particular example because this has um, you know, been kind of recognized pretty broadly as a moment that really put neural networks, um, now known as deep learning, um, kind of back in the center of the field of research. And this really demonstrates how influential benchmark data sets can be in setting research agendas across the entire field and even triggering new paradigms of research. And something that um, also uh, comes along with this is that the resurgence of neural networks as a modeling paradigm, you know, comes with um, a lot of kind of value-laden changes as well. Um, there's a great paper um, by Rotten and Millie titled um, Value-Laden Disciplinary Shifts in Machine Learning. And this talks about how this ImageNet win, which, you know, sort of played a big role in, in triggering this paradigm shift back to deep learning, really ushered in an era of ever larger data sets and compute powers, which of course has implications for who has access um, you know, to this field and to kind of push research agendas forward. Okay, so um, that's an example just of how you know, influential these benchmark data sets can be in shifting and setting research agendas for the field. Um, but this, and this competition style of research, right, it, it has led to massive advances. And so don't want to kind of discount um, the, the important role that these kinds of competitions can play, but it can also create super misaligned incentives. Um, if the goal is just to beat these benchmarks and outperform everybody else, 
um, that can create some fairly perverse incentives. So um, I'm gonna give like one particularly stark example. Um, and this is from 2015, where the winning team achieved their results um, essentially by breaking the competition rules, um, right? And this is, again, winning this competition meant so much. Um, it put the winners um, in this really, really valorized position. And so it, it created this like really, really perverse incentive to just win at all costs um, rather than really investing in, um, you know, kind of theory building and, and you know, advancing, um, you know, work that's a little bit more aligned with what the field might actually care about. Okay, so just to kind of like summarize this competition style of benchmarking, which again is this dominant mode of evaluation. So some nice things that fall out of this mode of research is that benchmark data sets become developed as shared community resources. And this is nice because developing data sets is quite costly. Um, and so developing them as shared community resources means that folks who don't necessarily have the resources to develop the data sets can still participate in the field um, and develop models on the data sets um, because they are you know, kind of publicly shared. And this also coordinates researchers around shared problems and goals. And this of course can lead to, to really massive algorithmic advances. They also enable a standard method of comparison, um, which can be really nice um, when there is a massive field and a lot of complex um, you know, algorithmic advances. Having a really clear way of comparing models in a standardized way can be really beneficial. Um, and it can relax the need for deep domain expertise in a problem space because a lot of the domain expertise comes into the development of a data set. Um, lots of folks can participate in algorithmic advances on that data set without necessarily needing to understand the nitty gritties of that problem. Domain. So all of this has led to massive progress, but um, sort of I can imagine you reading all of these things. Each of these comes with um, a kind of big risk as well. So some of the serious risks that come along with this mode of doing research are a really hyper focus on winning a competition can lead to the distortion of scientific progress. Um, it can stunt development of new ideas um, by disincentivizing approaches that are not optimized for the set of really overhyped benchmarks. And it can also devalue other important scientific priorities like theory building, um, or developing models that are built ethically and fairly and with close attention to the broader societal impacts. Also this model of, of evaluation, so it does provide the standardized method of comparison, but it also provides a very limited view into model performance in the absence of other methods of evaluation. Um, and this in turn can carry safety and fairness and equity implications as well. Um, because there can often be a mismatch between how an AI system is performing on a, you know, set of very limited benchmark tasks and the actual sort of current state of AI, like in the wild and in the world. Um, and finally, um, focusing on this, this sort of model of research really disincentivizes work that's connecting models more carefully to domains. So it can be nice, as I mentioned, to have folks kind of drop in and use a data set without necessarily, you know, needing deep domain expertise. But sometimes that domain expertise is really, really important in order to build systems responsibly. Um, and so um, that carries with it a, a particular risk. Okay, so I've just kind of summarized this competition style of research that is really characteristic of the field of machine learning. Next, I want to turn to this concept of a quote unquote general benchmark. Um, so I'm going to take a brief detour to describe a children's storybook, uh, and this is going to provide an analogy for a common machine learning practice. So in the 1974 um, Sesame Street book, Grover and Everything in the Whole Wide World Museum, the Muppet Grover, he visits a museum that claims to showcase everything in the whole wide world. Um, it's filled with a whole bunch of different rooms, and each room is des designated a particular object category and is filled with all sorts of representative objects of that category. And some rooms are, um, you know, pretty arbitrary and subjective, like the tall hall. Other ones are really oddly specific, like the carrot room. And so Grover makes his way um, through this museum, visiting all of these different rooms. Um, and then towards the end of the story, uh, he thinks he's seen all that there is, but he comes to a door that's labeled everything else. And of course, he finds himself in the outside world. Um, so in a recent paper titled AI and Everything in the Whole Wide World Benchmark, uh, we describe how recent evaluation trends in machine learning um, kind of mirror 
a sort of faulty logic um, that's embedded in everything in the whole wide world museum. So um, benchmarks, um, so we, we, we sort of term this the general benchmark um, and general is in, in scare quotes because um, this is sort of a term that we're you know creating to refer to these um, but it's also something that the kind of the community has come to agree upon in a sense um, and we use this to refer to benchmarks that are essentially presented as measurements of progress towards some kind of general ability often within really vague tasks like visual understanding or language understanding and these benchmarks, um, you know, one way of understanding them is that they kind of reflect an inappropriate extension of that common task framework. So recall the common task framework is this kind of paradigm of benchmarking that emerged in the 70s and 80s. It was really focused on very specific tasks. And so here we see that kind of paradigm being applied to really, really abstract, vague, or general purpose tasks. Um, and it's worth noting that sometimes these kind of claims or appeal to generality might come from the benchmark creators, um, but often they don't. Sometimes they just come from community practices that develop around the benchmarks. Um, so we're not necessarily saying that, you know, the developers of these data sets are making grand and oversized claims about them, although sometimes they are. Um, but oftentimes it's just that a data set gets instantiated and the rhetoric that surrounds it kind of gets carried away um, and is no longer rooted in what the actual data set represents. Um, and so <coughs> um, uh, it's, it's also sort of worth noting, we go into this a little bit more in the paper, but um, even when benchmark developers don't explicitly describe a benchmark with respect to general purpose capabilities, the motivation and setup for these kinds of benchmarks is often quite explicitly linked to general purpose capabilities or a kind of breadth of knowledge that humans possess and the desire to kind of build that into AI systems. But again, it's often just the sort of ethos and rhetoric that surrounds these data sets that um, sort of gets carried away and extends beyond the realities of the data set. Um, and this in turn can sort of dramatize what it means for a model to perform well on these tasks. So um, to come back to ImageNet, this is going to be my kind of canonical example throughout this talk. Um, uh, ImageNet is, is this data set, and it's, it's been described in these really grandiose and general terms. So it's been described as the most comprehensive and diverse coverage of the image world, an attempt to map the entire world of objects, the North Star of computer vision. Um, and it really has kind of taken on this outsized role within the field. Um, Increased performance on ImageNet um, has been explicitly referenced as an indication that the field is progressing towards general purpose AI. So we see this data set is, you know, finite, limited, um, developed for a particular purpose, but as the hype surrounding it kind of grows and grows and grows, suddenly performing well on ImageNet is used to back up a claim that the field is, you know, this much closer to artificial general intelligence. And so we see these kind of claims getting carried away. Um, but again, the reality is ImageNet is bounded. It's far from a comprehensive, you know, capture of the visual world. Um, just like Grover's museum visit it, that featured arbitrary categorizations, there's all sorts of arbitrariness embedded in the categorical choices of ImageNet contains categories ranging from very specific dog breeds to really, really high level notions like a New Zealand beach. Um, and again, this isn't to, you know, kind of knock the ImageNet creators or suggest that there wasn't an attempt to take a principled approach to the categorical structure, um, but just that the ultimate categorical schema is far from universal or general or comprehensive. There's just no general purpose way of slicing up the visual world. Um, and um, to kind of come back to one of the um, data set harms that I mentioned way at the outset here, um, there was also sort of little consideration given at the time of development to the inclusion or exclusion of certain words within the schema. And this was an oversight that was made visible by audits that I mentioned earlier on that exposed a range of toxic categories ranging from racial slurs and derogatory phrases. Um, these categories have now been removed from the data set. Um, the ImageNet creators have been um, really great and responsive to like a lot of the um, problematic things that have been coming out about this data set. Um, but again, this is just to kind of emphasize that 
the reality of ImageNet, you know, is fairly disconnected from this like grand rhetoric that has really surrounded it um, over over many years. Um, okay, so the basic kind of thesis like of this paper is that this quote unquote general benchmark it doesn't exist. Um, Right, it's sort of an imagined artifact. Real data is designed, subjective, uh, it embeds a perspective. There's just no neutral or universal or general data set. They're all limited in particular ways. Um, and the key thing is that this, these limitations really necessitate a different framing and a different um, way of talking about these data sets and describing claims. Um, to present a data set as, you know, sort of general is, you know, dangerous and deceptive. It can, you know, obfuscate all sorts of subjectivities and biases that are embedded in the data set, and it can enable misplaced conclusions through false presentations of performance and, and potential model misuse. Um, so another thing I want to highlight here is that you can sort of see how the like general benchmark itself has has come about through this competition style of research run amok, um, right? It's the sort of like social organization of the field around these really overhyped data sets. Um, this can kind of further heighten the risks of data sets being misconstrued as more general than they are. Um, another thing to note is that the kind of institutionalization of certain data sets often ends up implicitly endorsing these data sets as really meaningful abstractions of a task or a problem domain. So this is the way in which, you know, ImageNet is this large scale image classification data set. Performing well on ImageNet really does say something about a model's ability to do a really complex high dimensional, um, you know, prediction based on images, but it, it doesn't, say something about, you know, the ability to identify objects in the wild in the world, right? There's a huge gap between the kinds of claims that often get made and the actual kind of realities of a data set. And so when, you know, these claims kind of get disconnected, then we're signaling something um, and, we're, and we're creating this kind of false um, pretense of, of the actual realities of, of the field. Okay, so the final thing that I want to talk about here relates to institutional concentration. Um, and the majority of this comes from a recent paper, um, Reduced, Reused, and Recycled, The Life of a Data Set in Machine Learning Research. So um, this paper really tried to get at the question of how concentrated are machine learning task communities around specific data sets? So I, throughout this talk, I've been referencing how, you know, there's a couple of really hyped up data sets that the field coalesces around. And this was sort of like a vague hypothesis that we had coming into this work. Um, and this work was really about asking, like, is that true? Um, are folks, you know, kind of coming to the same data sets over and over again? Or are there a lot of data sets and research is really spread over all of them? Um, and then another thing that we were interested in asking was, you know, how frequently do machine learning researchers borrow data sets? from other tasks instead of using ones that were explicitly created for that task? And what kinds of institutions are responsible for the major machine learning benchmarks in circulation? And this final question is what I'm gonna focus on a lot here. And the way that we answered these questions was by using this online repository um, called Papers with Code. And Papers with Code, um, it captures um, a whole bunch of machine learning um, a bunch of machine learning uh, papers and data sets and benchmarking tables. I'm going to aggregate them all on this site. Uh, it's, there's not like a one-to-one -one mapping between the field of machine learning and papers with code, um, right? So this is sort of an approximation for um, the kind of organization of the field and the data set that the field is coming to and things like that. Um, but, you know, again, this is, this is an approximation to that. Um, and um, what we were able to do is look at, okay, you know, what papers are using different data sets? Um, what were those data sets originally developed for? So an example that I've shown here is the CIFAR 10 data set um, being used for two different tasks, image classification and image generation. And so we can look at what was the origin task? What was this data set designed for and what is it getting used for later? Okay. so. Um, a couple of quick findings we had here. First, data sets are regularly adopted from one problem domain to another. 
Um, this means that data sets um, that were uh, developed for, um, uh, sorry, data sets that are used for image um, generation, um, most of the time they came from um, another task. So the top and the bottom image here, this is showing um, data sets and tasks that, that data set, sorry, data sets and tasks um, that were the origin data set and task for image generation. And essentially we see that, you know, only a very small subset of uh, data sets used to evaluate image generation tasks were actually developed for that purpose. More often, we see that a data set was developed for face recognition or scene understanding or something like that. And then it was brought over and used to evaluate another task. Um, so this kind of relates back to the, the thing that I was talking about with these general purpose benchmarks as well, in the sense that we often don't see data sets rooted really deeply in a particular domain or problem space. Um, so this is, again, it's slightly different than this general benchmark, but the key takeaway here is folks are just kind of pulling data um, that is available rather than really carefully rooting data in a particular problem. Domain. Again, I'm speaking in like very, very broad generalities at this moment in time. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, okay, so then the main um, point that I wanna make with respect to this paper though, relates to institutional concentration. And so here we found that um, research is increasingly concentrated on um, data sets that have been developed by just a handful of institutions. And these institutions tend to be um, predominantly Western, really well-resourced elite institutions. So we have things like Google, Microsoft, Stanford, Princeton, NYU, um, we have these institutions being responsible for the development of a, a vast majority of data sets. Um, and so the, the reason that this matters, like the stakes of this tie back to this kind of competition style of research and the ways in which data sets organize the field of machine learning. Um, this means that we have a very small number of institutions that are sort of setting research agendas for the field. Um, and this is, you know, a kind of, you know, epistemic sort of concentration, essentially. Um, okay, so where are we? So I've so far summarized three kind of interconnected issues that characterize the social organization of the field of machine learning and how progress is defined and measured within this field. Um, these issues pose concerns both for um, kind of societal impact um, and harm, um, as well as scientific validity and progress of the field, um, right? Are we, are we doing good science? Are we really measuring what we think we're measuring? Um, and things like that. Um, so, right, the, the kind of social organization of the field around this competition style of benchmarks um, really enables a certain kind of shallowness, right? This is sort of what I was talking about earlier. This, you know, structuring competition in this, sorry, structuring research in this in this competition style, you know, can lead to gamified results, but it can also kind of reward winners that are working in this sort of a theoretical um, way. Of course, if data sets themselves are being developed with deep theoretical grounding, this actually might not be such a concern, um, right? But the prevalence of um, quote unquote general benchmarks indicates that the field isn't really sufficiently accounting for the inherent limitations of data sets. So again, this is like how these things are all coupled, all coupled, right? This competition style of research isn't inherently bad. It has led to a ton of progress. Um, but when you know data sets are not appropriately rooted in context, when we over index on um, you know, kind of beating a particular benchmark rather than other methods of evaluation, we can, you know, kind of, um, you know, run into, into tricky territory. And then again, we have this kind of, you know, significant epistemic concentration where just a small number of institutions are responsible for the majority of data sets. Um, okay, so with the remainder of like 10 minutes, um, I want to go into a little bit of like looking forward. Um, and I've broken this up into, 
three broad things um, that um, the field I think needs to be focusing on, many of which folks are already working on, right? So really want to emphasize, like I presented a lot of problems, um, but there's a lot of like in great, there's a lot of incredible folks who are thinking deeply about these, these problems and are working on kind of mitigating them. So um, first parallel approaches to evaluation. Um, so um, right, benchmarking um, can be really, really important. Uh, we don't want to like throw ML benchmarking um, out entirely. Um, but it's really, really important to contextualize reporting with respect to a data set's limitation, right? No matter how big a data set is, it still embeds some sort of perspective, um, you know, of the data set developers, of the labelers, um, of the data source itself, um, and of folks who are contributing to that data source. And so rooting claims um, in the specifics of a data set can really help mitigate risks of overhyped AI and also better contextualize um, what a particular level of performance actually means. And then ideally we would also be moving to a future where benchmarking is one tool um, of many. So there've already been a lot of calls for developers um, to report other model properties. So for example, um, energy consumption, uh, memory requirements, um, robustness and kind of stability analysis to kind of check, um, you know, does the output of my machine learning system change significantly if I change the input a little bit? Um, there have been a lot of like really important calls to include these sorts of things in papers as well. Um, and then additionally, uh, reporting negative results um, and really including ablation testing. Um, this can also give a much more nuanced picture of model performance and offer insight into um, the impact of different system components. Um, system output analysis or behavioral testing, as it's also called, um, can include things like error analysis, disaggregated analysis, counterfactual analysis. Um, so counterfactual analysis would be like um, I take a sentence and, and swap something out, um, maybe like pronouns or um, a name of an individual and see, does this change um, my, my model's prediction? And should it change my model's prediction? Maybe I want the system to be invariant to the pronouns um, in a sentence. And so if I swap them out and I see something different happen, then that tells me something about where my system is breaking down. Um, so these kinds of techniques can reveal um, different kinds of model failures that a system might produce, um, and in turn can also say something about what social groups might be uh, most vulnerable to different kinds of harm. Um, and sometimes these methods can also have a causal element to them um, and help identify um, what is the cause of a particular model failure. Um, and then systematic um, testing is really important. So developing like test suites, developing auditing frameworks, engaging in adversarial testing, where you're really trying to like break a system in a certain way. Um, all of this can really help map out um, which aspects of a problem space, um, you know, are still challenging um, for this system. Um, where do we really need to be focusing um, efforts? Um, and also kind of check for potential harms that are coming from, um, from the system. And so again, the kind of, you know, main thesis here is benchmarking is a really useful tool but it shouldn't be the only tool that we have, right? It provides a really, really um, sort of simplified and abstracted understanding um, of how a system is performing. And so that can be useful, but it's also important to couple it with other sorts of evaluations. Um, and again, the exact implementation um, of these kinds of other evaluations will be really context specific. Um, and this again, comes back to trying to root things in, in context and in domain. Um, okay. So new standards of benchmark development. Um, I think this is another thing that the field as a whole um, really needs to continue investing in. So um, one way of understanding some of the issues that were posed by these quote unquote general benchmarks is through the concept of construct validity. Um, and so generally speaking, construct validity captures how well an experimental setting relates to a research claim. And in the context of machine learning benchmarking, um, the thing that I think we want to be asking is how well does a benchmark data set and associated metrics of evaluation represent the task? Um, and there's a great paper here by Jacobs and Wallach um, that talks about um, 
measurement validity um, more broadly um, from an algorithmic fairness perspective. Um, and I really recommend that. Um, and again, we're kind of focusing on this here from this like benchmarks as evaluative and measurement tools. Um, so um, again, right, benchmarks are an important tool, but they're only effective to the extent that they have construct validity. And determining if a benchmark appropriately captures a task in question is actually not super trivial. Um, Bowman and Dahl note that there's no simple test that would allow one to determine if a benchmark presents a valid measure of model ability. Um, so I mentioned this just to emphasize that this isn't like a really simple and easy thing that people aren't doing. It's actually quite challenging and quite complicated. Um, but um, one thing that's important to note about these sort of general benchmarks is just that like due to their instantiation and particularities of the data, they just can't capture anything that is, you know, remotely close to these claims to generality that are often being made about them. So there is a really, really clear construct validity concern with respect to those really general benchmarks. Um, and then more generally, I think what we need to be doing as a field is really asking, you know, what is the precise task that my data set is capturing? And am I using language that aligns with that precise task? Or Am I, you know, kind of getting carried away and talking about how the data set is capturing language understanding or something really, really broad? Um, and again, there's a lot of nuance here because I'm talking about, you know, kind of rhetoric that surrounds these data sets. Um, but this rhetoric does shape how the field thinks about these things, how the general public thinks about these things. Um, and so it, it, is, it is quite important how we communicate about these results. Um, Okay, so then just a couple of notes here about actually incentivizing responsible data set development. Um, something that I did not focus on in this talk at all, um, but you know, that is a big you know, um, kind of focus of the field right now is developing standardized methods of data set development, analysis, documentation, maintenance, and so on. There's been a ton of advances um, in the past couple of years in the development of these kinds of standardized frameworks. Um, there's obviously a, lot, a long way to go in terms of actually integrating this into um, the kind of daily practice of machine learning researchers and developers, um, but there's a lot of work that's being done in this area. Um, and then something else that I think needs to be done is thinking about not just how do we like develop these standards, but how do we integrate them again into practice? How do we incentivize their use? Um, so Something that we're seeing in a couple of conferences that I think is really great is incorporating standardized frameworks into submission and reviewing guidelines. Um, so um, just as a one example of this, NeurIPS this year had an entire track dedicated to um, benchmarks um, and data sets. And part of their um, submission and reviewing guidelines included um, uh, questions about data set documentation. So that was a really, really you know, kind of nice intervention that they did in order to help incentivize folks um, to adopt existing frameworks. Um, okay, and then finally, um, sort of more diverse modes of knowledge production. And this is this is maybe one of the, the hardest ones to tackle. Um, so um, one key thing that I wanna emphasize is that simply incentivizing data set development um, really isn't gonna be enough um, to address this kind of epistemic concentration. Um, this is certainly important, right? We're seeing lots of um, interventions coming out of the field of machine learning that are designed to incentivize really careful data set development. The data sets and benchmark track at NeurIPS this year is a really great example, provided a venue for folks to engage in really careful data work um, and publish data sets where historically data work um, was typically sort of less valued within the machine learning community and it would be papers focused more on algorithmic contributions that would be published. So that was a really important intervention that really, you know, kind of put careful data work um, at the center of the machine learning community. But there's also this issue of positionality. Who is developing these data sets? Who has the resources to develop data sets? Um, and, and thus who is actually shaping research agendas of the field? Um, so one of the things we recommend in our paper is actually sort of policy-oriented intervention, right? What, how, how can we fund less resource institutions um, and institutions that are kind of not the kind of top players thinking about all sorts of different socio-demographic factors as well in order to shape, or sorry, in order to shift like who has the resources to shape data set development and set research agendas in the field. Um, 
So I think this is, you know, this is this is pretty critical. And this is, you know, this is tied into all sorts of conversations that are ongoing regarding, you know, SKUs and who is, you know, involved in this field, right? This is just kind of focusing on the data aspect of that. Um, another thing I think that is really important, and this is where, um, you know, this is very preliminary thoughts here, because this is sort of like where my mind is going now, um, is just thinking about how can we learn from other fields. Um, so um, different data heavy fields have developed different models of data governance. And so what can we learn from these other fields? Um, I think this is, this is something I, I generally like to do a lot in my work is just looking to other fields that are adjacent to machine learning or share some kind of similarity and, and how can we learn from um, the histories of those fields and the kinds of things that have been developed there. Um, just as one example, um, in, in biology, like data creation is, is really costly, um, but, but hugely valuable. Um, and the field has invested really heavily in um, centralized community run data consortium. And so um, like in machine learning, data becomes um, this kind of community resource. Um, but one of the key distinctions here is a structure that enables a more diverse set of participants in machine learning. Um, and so I think it would be really interesting to think about um, what would a, you know, kind of community run, um, you know, data consortium look like in machine learning, right? Like right now we have a lot of publicly available data sets and we have a lot of online repositories where people submit data. But how do we have different voices actually contributing to what data gets presented, what tasks get institutionalized, um, what research agendas get set? Um, so I think that's that's a really interesting question to, to pose. And I think if we could you know, make meaningful progress to shifting um, the kinds of perspectives there, that would go um, a long way. Um, and then um, you know, investing more heavily in kind of you know, basic research. Um, so you know, heavy um, industry concentration in the field of machine learning. Um, this is something that, you know, many folks have talked about. This is a, a pretty um, prominent thing. Um, and we also saw this in our um, uh, examination of who is developing these data sets. We see, you know, big industry labs who have the resources to develop, to develop these massive benchmarks are the ones who are doing so. Um, and, you know, obviously substantial industry investment in both basic and applied research. This isn't like inherently a bad thing. Um, but it can also, it can limit the research agendas that are emerging across the field. Um, and um, I think there is a deep need to invest in non-commercial research agendas. Um, there's a lot of um, really important problem domains um, that are not tied um, to kind of commercial um, interests. And so if we could think about, again, how do we um, put money there? How do we incentivize um, the kind of development of, of, of work in that domain? Um, and here again, I think biomedical research is a sort of interesting place to look um, where um, you know, the government is a really large sponsor um, of biomedical research. And there's a lot of um, like nonprofit institutions that don't have ties to industry that are kind of pursuing basic research. Um, and so I think it would be interesting to think about, um, yeah, how would, what would this look like in machine learning, um, right? Almost, almost every institution has some kind of close tie to industry. Um, and again, like this has led to a lot of incredible tools and advancements, um, but I think it can also be kind of hindering the field in a sense as well. Um, if we don't have sufficiently diverse research agendas that are being proposed and advanced. Um, okay, so that that's all I've got. Um, I wanna call out all of these delightful people um, on the slide here um, who have all collaborated in this work. Um, and, um, our co-authors on the various papers that I've presented and, and tried to mash together um, into some sort of narrative here. And I think I ended sort of on time of like 10 minutes to, to chat about things. Amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Emily. This has been so incredible and such a privilege to get your overview of this incredible body of work.